Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a day three of our youth conference. Uh, it's a little before nine. I just want to log in and let you know that we're waiting about three minutes. And then at nine o'clock exactly, we'll have our uh, chief executive officer, Mr. Francisco Almaraz, welcoming everyone. And then 9.05, we'll kick off with our first career exploration interview. Again, in about three minutes, we're going to be starting at nine o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, it's nine o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna get started with, uh, I'd like to introduce you all to our Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Francisco Amaraz. He'll be doing a welcome this morning, Mr. Amaraz. I see you're on. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, Workforce Solutions, uh, I wanna welcome everyone to the virtual uh, 2020 Youth Career Conference. We are living in unprecedented times, of course, uh, but students, teachers, and school districts uh, have been able to adapt and have shown a great deal of resilience as we all work together to do our part to combat COVID-19. This uh, is the first year that we've held a career conference online and we have received uh, over 2,500 registrations for this event. And that is really uh, incredible. Events like these uh, take a lot of planning and teamwork. Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Workforce Solutions staff that has helped uh, organize this event. Uh, first of all, our education team lead, uh, Mr. David Gutierrez, and our Workforce uh, Outreach Specialist, Ms. Uh, Yesenia Garcia, Ms. Irene Garcia, and Ms. Jasmine Hernandez. Uh, they've all done a great job in uh, putting together uh, this event. I also wanna thank uh, Mr. Sergio Contreras, president and CEO of the RGB Partnership for his support in engaging uh, the business community. Workforce Solutions uh, is committed to helping students uh, make informed decisions about future careers. And we wanna make sure you are prepared for these careers. Our workforce outreach specialists uh, work with you and your teachers uh, to help you better prepare for your career choice. They provide soft skills training, uh, including job search, interview skills, financial literacy, and of course, information that allows you to explore career opportunities and help guide you to a career that is right for you. 
these uh, workforce outreach specialists are enthusiastic about their work and it shows by the relationships that they have built with you and your teachers. Today's uh, Youth Career Conference has three tracks, career exploration, soft skills, and parental engagement, each designed to provide you with information you will need as you work on planning your future. We also wanna make sure to provide your parents with information on financial aid, on career information and planning process and stress management. So if your parents are not aware about this conference, please invite them to participate. Thank you for choosing to be here. Uh, and I hope you take uh, with you a better understanding about the resources that are very available and the resources that will help you find success in your careers. And remember, Workforce Solutions is always here to help you make those decisions about your future careers. Best of luck and stay safe. Thank you. Mr. Meraz, thank you so much for joining us and taking some time out this morning to welcome everyone. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, just to give you a heads up for those of you who are on the session, what's gonna be happening next and throughout the day. Uh, right now we're gonna have Mr. Jaime Cepeda from the Gladys Porter Zoo. Uh, he's going to be coming on and talking about his uh, work as an education assistant and presenter there. At 9.45, we've got Mr. Anson Green, Senior Manager, Economic Opportunity, Corporate Social Responsibility at Tyson's Food. Both of those individuals are representing the education field. Uh, and later on at 10.15, we have Mr. Pa Patrick Wilby, a dentist with big smiles. Uh, he will be representing healthcare as well uh, Dr. Henry R. Herrera, Jr. So with no further ado, it's uh, 9.05, 9.04. I'm gonna go ahead and get you started with um, the video. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll jot those questions down and get them to you, any answers to you by the end of the day. Thank you so much. Mr. Cepeda was born, raised, and educated in Brownsville, Texas. He is avid nature lover who is employed at Gladys Porter Zoo. There he delivers important wildlife conservation messages and lessons to more than 30,000 residents of South Texas on an annual basis. Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Hernandez and I'm a workforce outreach specialist with Workforce Solutions. Today we have a guest who will be providing us some information on his profession. Mr. Cepeda, can you please introduce yourself, your job title, and where you currently work? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, my name is Jaime Zepeda. I work uh, as an education assistant here at Gladys Porter Zoo. My main, uh, my main, my main duty, I guess you could say, is taking live animals uh, outside of the zoo and taking them out to various schools and city functions, stuff like that, uh, to promote uh, conservation, wildlife conservation, which is what our zoo is all about. How did you become interested in this occupation or field? Uh, well, you know, like like a lot of kids, um, as a kid, I was very, very much interested in animals. And uh, this interest never went away. It never diminished. Uh, in fact, as I got older, um, the interest kind of kind of kept growing. So I had never envisioned myself working at a zoo. It was always an interesting concept, but it was nothing. It wasn't necessarily a goal of mine. Um, I wanted to work for Texas Parks and Wildlife, and uh, but I started volunteering at Gladys Porter Zoo while I was while I was working my way through university, local university here in Brownsville, and um, in volunteering at Gladys Porter Zoo, I started networking and and meeting zookeepers and uh, getting to know folks here, and it seemed very very interesting. So one day, the, a position opened up, and they had me in mind, and uh, I guess so. My foot was kind of already in the door, so to speak. And uh, they offered me the job. So I've been here for for just over five years. And I, it's it's so, so interesting. Uh, there's never a dull day here at Gladys Porter Zoo. So I think that's super awesome that you did cover that you did network a lot, that you volunteered, a little bit of job shadowing, shadowing, I would assume. So that really allowed you to actually, like you said, put your foot in the door or have your foot in the door to get that job. So students, if you hear that, if you have that opportunity, go ahead and do that. What type of education? I'm sorry. 
Oh, absolutely. Just agreeing with you. It's very, very important. I mean, uh, volunteering once you're, once you're, uh, as young as you can, you know, uh, get out there, get, get a taste for, for any potential careers you might find interesting. What type of education training or background is necessary for your position? Um, well, for, for what I do, since I am, um, I am technically an educator, so it's very important to have that general background in science, you know, to have a full understanding of, of organisms and ecosystems, that kind of thing. Uh, so me personally, I have a degree in biology. Um, I went through school. I took uh, all the electives I could were all uh, focused or centered around ecology and wildlife biology. Um, and uh, like I said, I did volunteer at Gladys Porter Zoo, and I'm also a certified Texas Master Naturalist, which is another uh, volunteer endeavor that I had on the side. So um, I tried my best to surround myself, so to speak, in, in this field. Um, but yeah, I do have a four-year degree, and I, I would imagine any science educator at any zoo is going to have the same requirement. What type of skills, abilities, and personal attributes do you think are needed for a position like yours? Well, there's a lot of important attributes to have. Um, I mean, you got to be dependable. You've got to have uh, common sense. These are things that will aid you just about anywhere. Um, when you work with wild animals, uh, you have to be uh, not squeamish. You know, sometimes the animals uh, go to the restroom. Who's going to clean it up? Well, that's your job. Um, sometimes you get bit. Sometimes you, got, you get scratched. Uh, these are things you have to be prepared for. Of course, we try and mi minimize the risk as much as we can, but they are wild animals, you know, so, they're, so they are going to be wild. Uh, other important skills, um, you know, I hear a lot in my field from coworkers that, oh, I chose to be a zookeeper because of this. I chose to be a zookeeper because of that. Uh, and a lot of times you'll hear the same thing repeated. I chose to be a zookeeper because I'm not a people person. Uh, I, I identify better with animals than I do with other humans. And um, I find that a lot of times these people still have to be people person. Lies, you still have to associate with your coworkers because you, you are a big family, a team. Um, but a lot of times you interact with the public, you know, uh, people have questions and if they see you out there, guess who they're going to ask, you know, that person wearing the tan outfit. So people skills are definitely up there as well. Uh, you've got to be very observant. The animals, uh, the animals don't tell you if they're sick. The animals don't tell you anything. And it's up to you as a zookeeper or as a zoo worker to be able to spot these things. What does a typical work day look like for, look like for you? So um, typical work day is I have a schedule. I have a, I have a big calendar that has, uh, you know, all the days of the month for the next three, four months. And um, every time a school calls to book any kind of educational presentation, um, it goes up onto that calendar. So first thing I do, uh, I'll come in and I'll just take a quick glance at the day, see what I have. And almost always there's going to be something booked. Um, chances are if there's something booked for the morning. I will have already known about it because I'd take a look at, for, I'd take a look at the calendar for the, you know, for the, for the next several days. Um, but take a look at the calendar, um, have a bit of coffee, pack up some animals and just, and just hit the road, go, go visit some schools, go, go meet, meet some new people and, uh, and talk about animals. Go meet some new people and uh, and talk about animals. How has your typical day changed since COVID started? Now, are you doing doing it virtually for the students? Yeah, it has changed uh, dramatically. Um, now, a lot of schools are are doing everything online, and um, it's nice that we have this technology where we can you know where we can adapt to this to, to this global situation. Um, uh, because who knows what would have happened if this had occurred 20 years ago, you know? Um, but here we are today and uh, we get to show animals on camera. And I always tell the students that 
Um, yeah, sure. You're not seeing the animal in person. You don't get to touch the animal. But the nice part about it is I get to put that animal right up to the camera. And those kids get like a really, really close, detailed view of the animal. And um, then there's other little possibilities like with screen share. Uh, so I can show them pictures that would be kind of difficult. Self to some very unique and interesting opportunities. Uh, but yeah, everything so far has all been online. What type of problems do you encounter in your job? Hmm. Um, well, like with anything, uh, there can be some mix ups, some uh, some mix ups on our end. You know, we'll we'll double book something or or something like that. But nothing, thankfully, nothing too major. Um, things I'm always hoping that don't happen. Say, like for instance, mid presentation, is I get bit by the animal that I'm holding, um, uh, and it has happened. And it, it it's, I mean, it's going to continue happening because that's just what animals do, right? or the parrot that's biting on me. So it takes a few minutes to get them back on board. And, um, but yeah, the, the animals are a lot of fun to work with. I would say that's probably like the worst thing that can happen and it's not so bad. What type of decisions do you make on a daily basis or every other day? Um, well, one of the, I mean, it's not like it's a, a, a groundbreaking earth moving decision, but uh the things I have to consider are what animals I'm going to present because, because I'm always going to have the same underlying message when I talk to kids, it's uh, animals and conservation, protecting animals. Cause I can be talking about a raccoon. I can be talking about a snake. I can be talking about a parrot and I'm giving them different facts about all those different animals. But at the end of the presentation, um, all of the all of that information I'm going to give them is supposed to culminate into one big message. We need to protect these animals. Um, so really, the only real decision I have is what animals am I going to show these kids? You know, uh, I'm probably not going to take a 20 foot python uh, to go show three year olds. Probably not, because that might scare them. Uh, so those are those are the kinds of decisions I have to weigh and balance and consider before before I deliver an educational message to them. Um, I would say that's really the big, the only, the only big thing that I have to consider. Do you have a favorite animal or favorite animals that you like to take that you're like teacher, teacher's pets? <laughs> I do. I definitely have my go-tos. Um, we have, um, um, I'm a, I, I love spiders. They, they fascinate me. I think they're magnificent animals, but also at the same time, they creep me out. And, uh, and I find that most people are afraid of spiders as well. And what I like to do is, I, I, I'm <laughs> yeah, and it's the same thing. Like, you know what, I, you know what I notice a lot though, you take a spider or a snake to a classroom. The only ones who are going to be afraid of it are going to be the teachers. The kids want to touch all the kids want to touch, you know? So I have my go-tos and, um, just about any school I go to or any event, any place I go to, you can guarantee that I'm going to take a snake or a spider. Uh, I always take a snake. Um, those are definitely my go-tos, snakes, because that is an animal that has so much stigma attached to it, so much negativity associated with snakes and spiders. People are afraid of them. And what I try my best to do is dispel those fears. Okay, because a lot of the fears that we have in these animals are very, very irrational. You know, uh, sure, there are some dangerous snakes out there. Sure, there are some dangerous spiders out there. But 
I mean, they're not killing people in droves the way a lot of people imagine. I mean, uh, honestly, we have more to worry about mosquitoes, but you don't see people freaking out and diving under beds or, you know, locking their doors because of the mosquitoes. So um, it's these kinds of things that we try and um, uh, educate people on, you know, protecting animals and hopefully not going to go look for a shovel or a rifle when that snake wanders into their backyard. When it comes to your job, what do you find the most challenging and what do you find the most rewarding? Well, rewarding, uh, just seeing the look uh, of amazement um, when you bring out an animal out of its uh, out of its container. As soon as those kids, you see their eyes just fixate on that living thing that's in their classroom. Um, just that alone, that makes everything worth it. Um, the challenges, the things, the things that are difficult is, and it's not that bad. Uh, I really do think I have a wonderful, wonderful job here at the zoo. And I picture myself never, ever leaving, um, is, uh, sometimes I have to wake up early, early, like really, really early. Like say, for instance, if there's a school on the other side of the Rio Grande Valley and, uh, I have to be there at 8am, you know, school starts at eight. So I've got to be there for their first period, you know, or their first, their first session. Um, that means, Hey, that's like a two hour drive nearly. So I've got to be here early enough to load up animals, put them in the van and make that two hour drive over there. So sometimes I have to wake up really, really early, but that's about as bad as it gets. Who likes waking up early, right? And it's not like you can tell them, you know what? My shift starts at eight o'clock. So we have to move this 10 hour uh, to, to 10 o'clock in the morning, right? You have Absolutely. to. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the schools, the teachers, they have their schedules that they have to adhere to. Uh, you know, they called looking for us. We're the ones offering the service. So it's important that we're flexible. So it's very important that the, our department, the zoo as a whole, has to be flexible, but especially me, since they're relying on me. So I've got to be punctual, you know, I've got to be prompt, and I have to be able to meet them when they need me there. How does success look like in your position? Success. Um, wow. So I would say is... The more members of the public, the more students, the more parents, the more families we get to talk to, the more families we get to reach and deliver our message to, uh, that's success. We want uh, every opportunity we can take to talk to people about conservation, we take it. I mean, even if it means delivering a message for free, you know, we we have done these things, you know. Um, success is just reaching as many people as we can a high number there and uh, of course ultimately inspiring them because that's why we do what we do are there any opportunities for professional development when it comes to your position yes absolutely uh there's many different organizations that uh that a public speaker um can 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 join or affiliate themselves with uh there's toastmasters clubs there's uh, national organizations for interpretation. They all teach you how to be a better public speaker. Um, they teach you how to deliver a better story to people because even if you are just talking about an animal, where it lives, where it can be found, what it eats, really what you are doing um, is you're telling a story, you know? Uh, and the better storyteller you are, uh, the more people are going to want to listen and it'll make you delivering that message. It'll make, it'll make your time much easier and much more enjoyable. When it comes to working in your organization as in your position specifically, do you work more by yourself or do you work with a team? And if you do work in a team, what roles do they play when it comes to working with you? We are definitely a team. Uh, we are a small team um, here at the department of education at Gladys Porter zoo. There are a total of seven of us. And um, it's a small team when you consider what we do and what we're responsible for. Um, when it comes to what I do, specifically taking those animals out to schools, I have to rely on the zookeeping team that works here in our building. So that's two, uh, two guys whose sole responsibility are uh, feeding, cleaning, uh, exercising, enriching, uh, a group of, I would say, about 80 different animals that all have different needs, uh, different foods, different schedules, different rhythms. 
Uh, so that small team we have is very, very important. And that's to say nothing of the person who answers the phone when, when somebody calls us. Um, so we have our, our scheduling team, booking team. And when I say team, that's one person. <laughs> uh, so we rely on every single one of these cogs in this machine to, to work. Otherwise, the whole house of cards kind of just comes tumbling down. So yeah, I rely, I, re I definitely rely on other people. When it comes time for me to actually go out to a school to deliver the message, to do that presentation, um, I almost always go alone. But uh, the setup and the prep to get there went through at least three or four different hands. So we rely on each other. When it comes to your typical work and personal life balance, is it good? Is it bad? Is it balanced? Or how does your job affect your general lifestyle? Um, not a whole lot. Like when I first started working, um, it's important to, how do I put this? It's very important that I have answers for people when they ask questions, because that's my job. And when I, when I go out to a school, it's not just the students that are asking me questions. Uh, the PE coaches, you know, the administrators in the office, the teachers. And I've been already after doing this for five years, I've been asked thousands of questions to where I think I've already reached the point where I'm just answering questions that I've already been asked before. But every now and then I'll get, I'll get stumped, you know, and I'll get asked that one question that I don't know. So at the very beginning, when I started working uh, at the zoo, uh, even in my off time, when I'd be at home, I'd be on the computer. I was glued to certain websites and I'd be learning about different random animals um, that, that maybe I didn't necessarily work with. I mean, I don't take a rhino out to schools, but I would learn about the rhino and I would learn about hippos and I've learned about giraffes. And these are animals that I don't directly work with, but it's important because people are, people are looking at me as I'm, I am representing the zoo and they are going to ask me those questions. And I am an educator. So I have to have that knowledge. Um, to be able to give them those answers when they ask. So at the very beginning, man, I was always just learning, learning, learning. And uh, now at this point, people ask me like, how do you know all this stuff? It's like, well, I spent my first few years here just like basically always learning stuff about animals. Um, so it's fun. I've learned a lot. And to be honest with you, I'm still learning. You know, there's still a lot of stuff you have to learn. It never stops. It never stops, but it's good because, again, you are the one representing the zoo and they see you as an expert. And the good thing is that when somebody asks something that you are not aware of or that you don't know the answer, you look it up and then you do have those answers for future people. Right, exactly. And what I always do is when I say I do get stumped, say that one kiddo asks that question that I have never been asked and I have no idea, um, what I'll always do is I'll ask for the teacher's email address. Um, so I'll tell them as soon as I get back to work, uh, I'll ask one of our herpetologists. I'll ask one of the bird keepers. I'll ask somebody and I'll get you a good answer and I'll email it back to you all. So the teacher can, because I hate leaving blanks. You know, nothing bugs me more than leaving a blank spot uh, in the talk. So I want to do my best to answer all those questions because some of these kiddos, I mean, they have such wonderful uh, curiosity and I just hate to leave that uh, unfed, you know? <laughs> Very important to answer those questions. What would you recommend for students to do in order to prepare for a, a career in, in your field? Um, as I said earlier, volunteering is very important. Um, uh, we have programs here at Gladys Porter Zoo where um, kids, uh, they're not going on right now uh, just because of, of a global situation right now. Um, but once things get up and running, we're hoping in, hoping in the next few months um, these programs can start up again, but we do have programs for uh, kids as young as grade seven, all the way up to their senior year in high school, can start volunteering here at Gladys Porter Zoo. Um, they can participate in a program that we have called STS, where they learn to present animals, kind of like how I do, and they present their animal to the public. Um, so they'll get to hold that snake or that tortoise uh, or whatever animal they choose. Um, we have other programs where the kids can come in and help our giraffe feeding crews um, sell tickets, giraffe feeding uh, experiences to the public. 
Same thing with our Galapagos tortoises. Uh, it's important that if you want to work in a zoo, you have to consider that it's very important to volunteer because when a position does go up, say there's one position open, that's one spot, and we get over 100 applications from uh, potential zookeepers all over the country, okay? So you need to do something to make yourself stand out. And uh, if you've been volunteering here since you were you know, 12 years old, then that's going to hold a little more weight than somebody who we don't even know. Like we know this one kiddo practically grew up here at the zoo, has been volunteering here since seventh grade, uh, or even before that, they were taking classes here at the zoo because uh, you can start taking classes here as early as pre-K. Oh. So uh, we have some kids, some employees that were practically raised here at Gladys Porter Zoo. So if, if, if a career in the zoo field is something that really interests you, it's something that you could start already. And the good thing about it is, and guys, if you don't know this, when you volunteer, you can actually put that on your resume. That oh, can be sure. experience, unpaid experience, but that looks really good for you in the future. For sure. I mean, if I were an employer and I learned that, hey, this person was willing to do all that stuff for free, like I know that that's going to be somebody who's very dedicated, somebody, somebody that's going to be very, very dedicated and loyal uh, to that career path that they chose. Definitely. What other factors besides education and experience may impact the ability for somebody to work in your career? For example, do they have to have a good uh, credit? Do they have to have a clean uh, background when it comes to the criminal background, availability, willing to travel? So the credit, uh, no, uh, you don't have to worry about that. What they will do, however, is uh, is a drug screen. We'll do a drug screen. Uh, they will, um, what was the other thing? What was, that, what was that last part you asked me again? Their availability to travel, like you said earlier, that you have to go from one side of the Rio Grande Valley to the other. Yes. Um, so we do have a lot of staff members here that do travel. Uh, I travel um, for educational reasons to go out to different schools. Uh, even the zookeepers travel. Um, say we have an animal that we need to deliver to another zoo because it's already reached breeding age and it's going to start... Uh, breeding with the females at another zoo out of state, uh, those zookeepers are going to travel. They, um, we, can't, we can't put a giraffe in a FedEx box, right? So uh, it's our responsibility to get that animal from point A to point B. So yeah, there is definitely traveling. Um, there's going to be working at odd hours sometimes. Uh, definitely. It's, it's, it's not, I wouldn't, look at, I wouldn't look at it as just a job. You kind of have to look at it as a career, you know, because it's it's really um, it really kind of is going to encompass uh, a lot of the effort that you're going to have at that particular time. You're going to have to put in a lot, um, but you're also going to find it's, it's extremely rewarding, extremely rewarding. That's why when that position pops up, you get so many people applying for it because everybody wants to work at a zoo. It's something that it's not very common. I know that this is the only zoo that's here in the Rio Grande Valley. So I'm assuming that when a, one position does open up, you get applications from everywhere in the nation, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, very highly competitive is the best way to describe it. Highly competitive. And um, I mean, there are other organizations here in the Valley um, that are kind of uh, not zoos per se, but they do have, they do, they do take animals out to school. So there is a little bit of competition, um, but we're the only AZA accredited zoo. You know, we are, we are uh, a zoo that has accreditation, which means our animals are healthy. Our animals are well-fed. We're doing everything we can to make sure our animals, our workers, and our guests are safe, that kind of thing. What do you think is the secret to getting to your position, where you're at right now? Um. My secret was just the volunteering. Uh, I know that's something I've already mentioned um, two separate times, but the only reason I'm mentioning it, mentioning it, it again is because that's going to be your that's going to be your ticket. You really there's no better way to pick up a job than to start doing that job for free, volunteering, uh, because your future employers, your you you, when it comes time for you to apply and look for work. They're going to be like, wow, we don't even have to train this person. You know, they've already worked here or volunteered here for X amount of years. We already know um, their personality. They work very, very well with the team. Um, 
it's almost as if you're going to skip the whole, you're going to skip ahead to the front of the line. So that's the best thing you can do. Start volunteering as early as possible. Thinking back on your very first job, how did it play a role in the skills that you have developed for your current job? Um, well, I've always been an introvert. It might be, um, it might be difficult to, to tell from somebody who, who speaks publicly for, for a living. But I mean, it's true. Growing up, I was an introvert. And just like I said earlier, a lot of people choose to work with animals because they're not necessarily good with people. Um, I didn't know I was going to work at a zoo. But when I got hired here, I was like, oh, perfect. You know, and I remember at my interview, they asked me, what, what would you say your, your biggest weakness is? I was like, public speaking. <laughs> and they all, they all laughed because I was like, you know what job you're applying for, right? Because uh, I was very shy. My first job... Um, I, I would sack groceries and I was, I was very, very shy, but just being out in front of people, learning that, uh, that, you know, people aren't there to embarrass you, you know, just learning some very basic people skills definitely plays a role. Um, you know, cause eventually you're going to have to break out of that shell. You are going to have coworkers. You are going to deal with customers or guests or visitors. So it's important to, to have some people skills. And I started learning from, from my very first job, how to kind of break out of that out of that shell. Any last words that you have for our students? Um, last words, I would just say, um, study hard. You know, uh, it's an interesting time we're living in. Uh, be safe, keep working hard. Uh, if you want to work at Gladys Porter Zoo or any zoo for that matter, um, you got to work hard. You got to love science because that's what it's all about. Uh, we are a scientific institution. We are a learning institution. Uh, so it's important to, to, to prepare yourself the best you can. You know, I, I loved animals since I was a kid. If you love animals too, who knows, maybe one day you could be part of our team. Mr. Sabella, thank you again for taking the time to, to actually complete this interview. I know that you're super busy and this information is extremely valuable for those watching the video. And guys, if you're interested in learning more about this career or any other career, Go ahead and feel free to check out our links, Texas Reality Check, Texas Career Check, Own It, and Career Coach on our website, wfsolutions.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We'll see you all around. Thank you very much for uh, bearing with us. We had some technical difficulties there. I know that at the beginning we didn't get to share the video. Uh, but again, in these times right now, as we are learning to go virtual, we're experiencing some glitches. So thank you again for having the, having some patience with us. Uh, that concludes the first interview. We've got uh, Mr. Anson Green, who will be coming on. We'll start his video in uh, 945 so we can stay on schedule. So that gives you about a 10-minute break to uh, stretch out, go get something and drink, some coffee for you coffee drinkers. And we'll be back at 945 with Mr. Anson Green, uh, with, uh, who works with Tyson Foods. So Again, thank you so much for the patience and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
All right, thank you so much. That's uh, 9.44, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Our next presenter is Mr. Anson Green. Uh, you should be seeing his video on screen. He's a senior manager for economic opportunity, corporate social responsibility in Tyson Foods. Uh, those educators uh, from here may uh, be familiar with Anson Green. He was with Texas Workforce Commission. Uh, currently, Mr. Anson Green develops career pathways training at Tyson Foods World Headquarters. Prior to his arrival at Tyson Green, Anson led the federal adult education program at the Texas Workforce Commission. While he was at the Alamo Colleges District, Anson directed a specialized training center in San Antonio's historic West Side, delivering bilingual and integrated education and training. Anson has served as a national research fellow, spoken in congressional briefings and an effective approach to education and has a teaching posts at several colleges, universities, and public schools. Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Hernandez and I'm a Workforce Outreach Specialist with, work with Workforce Solutions. Today with us, we have a very special guest who will be giving us some information on his profession. Mr. Green, can you please introduce yourself, your job title, and where you currently work? Hi. Uh Hello, everybody. I'm Anson Green. I'm the uh, senior manager for economic op opportunity at Tyson Foods. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got to Tyson Foods and uh, what my relationship is to education during this presentation. So let me tell you a little bit about my uh, story through education, and that might help make things make a little bit of uh, sense for you. Uh, you're on a journey yourself going through high school and finishing up and uh, going into adulthood and you're probably thinking about what are you going to do next in life here and i'll tell you a little bit about my story um i wasn't very good in school and i never thought i'd end up in education um school was boring to me i enjoyed it doing things uh outside of school being with my friends hanging out um and my grades weren't too good i graduated at the bottom of my class and after i got out of high school i just got on a motorcycle drove around took odd jobs here and there to make some extra money. I uh, worked at a car wash for a while, um, made money, and I thought I'd be working at car washes, but good thing I'm not working at car washes because this is what the car wash looks like now. Um, the whole time I was on that journey though, I was always reading a lot of books and that really paid off for me. I just love to read and I read and read all the time. Um, and I ended up going to college and I studied ancient history and I learned Greek and Latin and studied ancient history and all that. Uh, interesting stuff to me, but it wasn't very interesting in terms of getting a job and I could not find a job anywhere with my education and that started to really frustrate me. It seemed like um, when I got out, even though I was glad I went to college and I was passionate about it, it was a hard time finding me, a uh, hard time for me to find a job. Um, and then I uh, started to really get creative and said like, I've got to just, I got to make money. I got to find a way to pay off some student loans and to really make a career myself. And I think that ended up being one of the most important things I ever did, which was keep my options open. Um, and that has really proven out for me. So um, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a job. I was applying all over the place, but I wanted to be in education because I loved reading. I loved education. And I took a job to teach a GED class in San Antonio, Texas, where I live. And that job that was only 10 hours a week and only made uh, $11 an hour, but that job transformed my life. And I took it and it was a, a different option. I took it out of desperation almost, but it really, really helped me out. I taught GED for seven years in San Antonio in a workforce development center and learned a whole lot about um, education, about what individuals really need to succeed. And that really gave me some fire it drove me and i think one of my main messages to you is, is you got to find what really inspires you and what drives you i ended up working at alamo colleges in san antonio and i ran a center called the west side education and training center and we trained people there we taught them uh, esl ged and we also did summer camps we had kids come in and learn about solar energy and about conservation and did all kinds of fun things with summer camp so i really expanded my options and this is the guy that didn't like high school. This is the guy that graduated at the bottom of his class. And now I was really getting somewhere in a career that I really enjoyed and really liked. So you never know which way uh, your direction is going to go. After I left the college, I ended up becoming the state director of adult education in Texas, working at the state capitol. So I had hit the big time. And again, 
This was the state director of adult education who never thought he would be in education when he was in high school. So you just never know uh, what direction your life's going to go. And in that job, it was very demanding. And I worked uh, around the state working with all kinds of of fantastic people like Jasmine out there. And uh, it was really, really taught me a lot. And so one of the things you might want to know is like, what's a job like that like? What's a job um, in government like? Or what's a job in education like? And I can tell you one thing is you got to be quick on your feet. It's very fast moving and very busy. Every day, I kind of felt like this at the beginning of the day. And my job was to make sure that the wheels stayed on and that everybody knew what they needed. I directed a huge program when I was at the state. And it really gave me some skill sets to help be a good leader and a good listener to what people needed. I found myself always negotiating. And I think um, some of you guys and gals do that in your jobs uh, at school right now. You're negotiating with friends. You're negotiating with teachers. You're negotiating with folks on sports teams and extracurricular activities. And that's a very good skill to manage. And you guys and gals, you know, sometimes people do that effectively and sometimes they don't and they get into conflicts. Um, But for my job, uh, the main thing is, is always trying to find the best and skills of what somebody can do to help you get to the next level of what you need to accomplish. Um, So the decision making and those kind of things were very, very instrumental for me. I also had to be a good public speaker, which is probably why I, I volunteered to do this session with Jasmine right now. Uh, I like speaking. I like being in front of people. And that might be something you want to do some self-analysis on. Is that something you like to do? Because in my job, I speak all the time. And sometimes uh, people like to do that. And then sometimes people don't. So if you don't like to speak, don't get into a field where you think you're going to have to speak. And if you do like to fe- uh, speak, Try to find something that'll drive you like that. Here's me. Uh, my speaking engagements would be really diverse. I'd speak to here a group of uh, college uh, uh, presidents from China. They came to visit us in San Antonio and wonder, what do you do at community colleges in San Antonio? So I've had opportunities to speak with folks all over the world, um, speak in front of big groups, speak in high school uh, uh, basketball gymnasiums and speak in front of uh, congressional committees. This is me at the U.S. Capitol speaking in front of a congressional committee on education. Um, In my field, you also need a lot of good reading and writing skills. And that's why, remember early on, I said I always liked to read. Even before I wanted to go to college, I was always reading books. And so that really paid off for me. Now I write books. I've written legislation. I've written all kinds of things. And that's a big skill set that I had early on when I was in high school, um, and I really am applying now. So you got to find what drives you. What are the things that really fuel your engine? Um, this was a, an amazing moment for me. I was in Washington, D.C., leaving a big meeting at the, at the Capitol, and I ran into a student that was in my GED class 15 years before. She was now a community health worker in San Antonio. That's why we're at the airport together, going back to San Antonio. Um, but she had made it too. She was now uh, a leader in community health, and she had gotten her start on the west side of San Antonio where I was teaching. So things like that really drive me. Here's me, though, talking to the secretary, assistant secretary of education. That drives me too. So you have to find things. They could be small things. They could be large things that really fuel your engine and make you want to get up in the morning and and go to work and pursue uh, something that brings uh, joy to yourself. But you got to have a lot of fun. You see me, I like to have a lot of fun no matter where I go. And that's the other thing. You can be a state director, you can be a big shot, but you can still have a lot of fun. There's me at Santa Claus last winter uh, at Christmas time. So um, don't think that if you get a job in politics or in government, it's uh, all like quiet and and boring and people don't have a lot of fun. It's a different world out there in the real workplace. Um, Let me tell you a little bit about what I do today. Now I work at Tyson Foods, where the people that make chicken and chicken nuggets and all kinds of uh, food products. And you think, what does that have to do with college? What does that have to do with education? Well, I'm helping Tyson Foods um, uh, build their ability to provide education for their workers. This is what I am. This is how I applied for the job. Right now, during the pandemic, you're going to apply for a job, most likely online. Many of you already did that. I got my notes in front of me. I put my camera up, my my laptop on a box, and I interviewed for the job. Who would ever guess? 
But when you start doing that, and I know Jasmine's been online talking a lot about online job interviews, um, it's a different world. And uh, uh, I did have uh, a pair of jeans on. I didn't have shorts on like some people do, but I had a suit on too. Um, and that's something you need to think about too, is how you're going to apply for that job. So I got the job at Tyson, and now I'm working with individuals from all over the country um, on education and training to help them uh, do better for themselves and their families. So when you think about your journey, first things first, finish school, stay in school and go get more school because the further you are from that goalpost, the further you'll be from the things you want to do in life, buy a car, have a place to live, move out of your parents' house, have a girlfriend, have a wife, have a family, um, have fun. You got to have education. One thing I would tell you too, try not to get into too much student debt. Make sure you apply for student aid if you're going to go to college and look around for resources because um, getting, uh, look at me, I got a job, I, I got a college degree that I couldn't get a job in and I had student debt and that was going to be challenging. Luckily, I found my way. But you guys know it, you, you folks know it, you've got people that are in your family or maybe in your community, your sisters, your brothers that um, are, have a lot of student debt and that's really challenging people. Um, here are some students that were in my uh, college program at the college, and they got their GED, and then they went on to college. But you know where they went? They went to remedial education because they still did not have enough education, and they acc accrued a lot of debt. They got a lot of student loan um, on just remedials, and that's something you don't want to end up in, but a lot of students in your position right now do end up in. So get those skills up. Take advantage of free training programs and free education programs. But know this, you're very unique. And the path that you're on is going to be different than the one from your sister, your brother, your friend, your mother, your father, other people in your life. you got to find your own path. Um, and you'll get where you want to go if you do that and listen to yourself. Try to plan ahead. Um, you don't always get it right the first time, but keep your options open and think about possibilities. Um, sometimes you have to get really creative in life um, and you got to work around things sometimes that are hard to work around, but find a way to make it work for you and find a way that you can drive it because um, getting creative sometimes means really going out on a ledge, um, but you can do it and you have to keep working at it. Um, find new ways of doing things, uh, be creative uh, and listen to yourself and what you want to do. And sometimes you have to get really creative um, but uh, I, I know that I, I kept my options open and I thought about what I wanted to do. Things weren't always the way I wanted them to be. I got stuck a few times. Um, I didn't feel like I was going to make it out. Um, but I kept a vision forward of positivity and talking to people. I wasn't sure which way I wanted to go sometimes. Um, but it's not a one or two way street. It's not two options. There's really a lot of options for you out there. And um, you might go to college and think um, today that you want to be a certain occupation uh, and in three or four years or in one year or in 10 years, it might change. Uh, and that's okay. That's what happened to me. That's what happens to most people. Um, you change a lot in your career and it's about the skills you have that are durable, your, your reading and writing skills, your communication skills, your attitude about life. Those are the things I've hired a lot of people. That's what people hire on. That's in Jasmine's business. They, ha they help folks get jobs and they talk a lot about uh, possibilities, about finding what uh, you're interested in and about really how to present yourself and, um, and be professional. And uh, life never gets easier, really, but you get a lot better. And so it does get easier as you get better. So with that, I want to turn it back to Jasmine and, and talk a little bit about um, some questions she might have for me. I know you gave us a brief description of what you do with Tyson, but can you elaborate a little bit more what your role as an educator or in the education background has to do with Tyson, even though when we think about Tyson, like you said, we think about chicken nuggets and chicken breasts. What exactly do you do with them? Well, uh, it's a great question. Um, Tyson Foods is a, a, a world, uh, one of the biggest companies in the world for food processing. And we hire a lot of individuals that, that work um, in the plants that make food. And a lot of those individuals are immigrants and refugees from all around the world. We have some plants that have 50 different languages in them. Five, zero, 50 different languages. People from all over the world working in those plants. 
And um, they need ESL. They need education and they need training. And that's what I got hired to do at Tyson Foods is to really take the skills that I learned working at Alamo colleges, working at the Texas Workforce Commission, and helping the company train those workers so they can be safer on the job, be more satisfied on the job, be able to provide better for their families in terms of helping their kids with school, and, and really live the American dreams. And that's what I do in terms of helping those uh, uh, workers. So I'm not making chicken nuggets, um, but I'm helping train and uh, uh, teach the individuals that work in those plants. Did you ever think that you would be working in the same field that you were working with here in Texas, doing the same thing with education with Tyson? Did that ever cross your mind? Never, never once crossed my mind. I, uh, that's what I was referring to earlier. I just never could believe that um, I would be in education, first off. Um, because I, when I got out of high school, I told my parents, I said, I'm not going to be the kind of guy that goes to college. I don't want to go to college. I barely got out of high school. Um, but just in a few years working, you know, uh, uh, the jobs I had, which were often difficult, they were very hard and I didn't make a lot of money. Um, and I liked adventure and I liked, um, being with people. And I knew I, if I wanted to have a family, I was going to have to do something different with my life. Um, but it took time. I didn't do it overnight. It took three or four or five years before I really snapped into going back to school. And, um, and then when I did, I never stopped. And then when I went to school, I got out and I still couldn't find a job. Um, and I thought, what have I done to myself? You know? Um, but I didn't worry about it because I went to, I wouldn't have gone to school if I didn't pursue what I, uh, was in, in, interested in. I was interested in history in ancient history. And that's what I went to school. And if, if I was going to go to school for business, I would have dropped out. If I was going to go to school to be a nurse, I would have dropped out or a doctor. I would have dropped out. Um, I went to what, what interested me. And that was what was important because I learned better skills. I learned how to read better. I learned how to write long papers. I learned how to negotiate schedules. I learned all kinds of transferable skills um, that I could use um, in other uh, occupations, but I got out and I couldn't find a job. I take a job making eleven dollars an hour at um, at teaching GED. I could have made that much money working at a McDonald's, um, but I didn't. I took a job because I wanted something in education, and that really just drove me forward. And um, I found that I was pretty good at it. And uh, I think it was because I was passionate and because I was interested in it that really um, uh, gave me the career success I've had. If I didn't have the passion and the fire. I don't think I would have uh, reached uh, the accomplishments I've been able to reach so far. What does a typical work day look like for you? Uh, the typical work day, um, you know, I'm at a, a pretty high level now, so it's, it's pretty busy. Um, I, I typically um, get up and uh, work now at home, but I get up, you know, start working at 6.30 or 7 um, in the morning often. And uh, I spend a good, I try to schedule my mornings. So I do a lot of my um, heavy thinking time in the morning where I have to write a, something or I have to um, read a document or analyze something. I do that early because that's when my brain is freshest. A lot of caffeine and I'm fresh and I'm rested. And then I have meetings most of the rest of the day. And um, um, uh, oftentimes I'll have two or three meetings in one hour. Uh, they're really short and we meet and um, it gets very exhausting sometimes. So you have to pace yourself. Um, one of the hardest things for me is learning how to take a break. So I have to build in breaks um, and uh, just say, I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm not going to be on a computer. I'm just going to sit there and uh, uh, talk with people, eat lunch and, and take a break. But that, that's a discipline very hard for me. Um, and then um, pre-pandemic, I did a lot of traveling. So um, I would be on the road two or three days a week in different cities, presenting, meeting with people and doing all of that. And that's very tiring, too. You have to build in that kind of uh, exhaustion, too. Um, but uh, it's very different than when I was teaching. Uh, teaching was different for me. Um, still a lot of prep work, you know. Um, a very effective teacher has to do two or three hours of prep work for one hour of class, typically. Um, and uh, that means I would get up and really do a lot of prep for two or three classes that I would teach at the college. Uh, and, and that's a different work style, but it still takes discipline and kind of scheduling 
And those are two things that um, really drive my life is a good schedule and disciplining myself. What do you find the most challenging when it comes to your job and the most rewarding? Uh, the most the most rewarding I'll start with first. Um, the most rewarding I think is when I feel like and I see that I have an impact. Um, I saw it every day when I was working with students. Somebody would get a GED. Somebody would get accepted to college. Somebody would uh, graduate from college. Uh, and I still I have students that I am in contact with now that I taught 15 years ago. Um, and so those rela the, the relationships are very important for me personally. Um, when I saw uh, that student in the airport in Washington, D.C., I was amazed. I could not believe that I saw her there and that she had achieved uh, just like I had. You know, we were both at the beginning. I was at the beginning of my career. She was getting her GED when we met. And now we are both in Washington, D.C., kind of having achieved a lot. That was just amazing to me. So that's that really drives me. Um, it's not about uh, 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 getting my way. Uh, it's not about um, uh, a good budget, although I got to have a good budget. But it's not those aren't those things are important, but they're just uh, part of the process. To me, it's seeing the outcome, seeing accomplishments is very important to me with people, accomplishments with people. Um, that have also had their lives changed. Um, the challenges for me um, are sometimes um, getting the right people together to get something accomplished. Um, a lot of my work um, is not something that Anton Green wakes up and he can accomplish by himself by the end of the day. My work relies a lot on um, getting three or four other people or other organizations to help me get to a certain point. Um, and that means I have to get everybody on the same page or on my page um, as much as possible, but listen to what they need also. Because if I if it's all about what Anson wants, somebody else is going to say, well, I'm not part of this club because I don't care what Anson wants. I care about what I want. So I have to negotiate and really find ways to get to the next phase together. And that can be challenging sometimes. Um, I like to do it. But it doesn't say it's not hard work sometimes. Right now, I have a project, and I'm really challenged at it. And um, uh, a few years ago, I probably would have been, been more challenged. Now, I've kind of built up enough strategies where I know I'm going to get where we need to get. Um, but I just got to keep working at it and not give up. And so persistence and negotiation, I think, um, can be challenging. But they're also something I know I, I just have to do it to get what I need to get to. And uh, I've kind of not got so upset about it anymore um, and I just kind of figure it out. Is it easy for you to balance your work life and your personal life? No, I'm terrible at it. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me. Um, uh, a lot of it's because I have a very demanding job um, and I've had one for many years. Um, I also had a job, um, this, this is something I didn't mention, but I live in San Antonio, Texas uh, and I've lived here since 1995. But I worked in Austin for 14 years. So I drove to Austin every day, which is, if anybody knows, uh, driving on I-35 is about almost two hours one way. So I would drive three to four hours a day um, uh, to, to work. And that shows you my commitment and shows you how much I love the job. Uh, it might show that I, I probably need a mental evaluation, too, because it's pretty difficult <laughs> traffic sometimes. But you know what I did during that commute? I did a lot of my meetings. I did phone calls and I did a lot of meetings during that period. So, um, uh, uh, but, but, uh, you know, I got things done, but it, it, it was difficult on my family because that was three or four hours. I wasn't at home. Um, and, uh, my new job, hopefully when the pandemic lifts and I, I get to move to Arkansas where Tyson foods is headquartered, I won't have to drive two hours a, a day to work. But, um, uh, making time for my personal life, for myself, um, has always been challenging for me. And um, uh, I don't I don't think I've gotten a lot better at it. I try to, but I don't feel like I've gotten as as, as uh, successful at it as, as I'd like to be. So that's a, still a goal I need to accomplish. What other factors besides education and experience may impact somebody that's trying to pursue a career in your field? 
For example, do they have to have good credit, clean background, availability when it comes to outside hours of eight to five? Yeah, um, I think in education, um, and, and all of you are in education right now, and uh, so uh, this is like the backstory of your teachers right now, but um, yes, you've got to have, you know, good uh, uh, background checks. Uh, I can tell you working at the college, I did a lot of training for individuals that wanted to go into certain positions like healthcare. And they couldn't go in because they had a background that was not going to let them in. They had bad uh, criminal background checks and things like that. And that really limits people's options um, for many, many fields. Um, you might not think that now, but um, a little mistake when you're young can really have a long time impact on, on your dreams, on what you want to do in the future. Um, but I think also the things that are important are being able to listen well to other people. And uh, uh, sometimes we think the world circles around us and uh, uh, we don't. Uh, the, the world doesn't circle around us and we have to work with other people. And sometimes you're not going to agree with them. So I think listening well is important. And if you can listen uh, uh, very well and, um, and then find ways to get where you need to go, um, you can uh, often get there a lot uh, sooner than if you try to just go your own way and get people to come on board with you. Um, but there, there's a lot of skills. I would, I, I, I can't underestimate the fundamentals of reading and writing um, uh, and math, honestly. My math is terrible. And uh, how I ever got to manage an $80 million budget when I was in the state of Texas, I would never believe that would have happened. And thank God for Microsoft Excel. But um, uh, I didn't learn math well in school and it still haunts me today, honestly. Um, so those fundamentals um, that you think of in high school, uh, who cares, uh, writing, writing long papers, communicating well, those come up in a lot of jobs. And you don't have to be an expert at it. You don't have to write books, um, uh, but you have to be able to have the fundamentals. And sometimes people don't pay enough attention about those. And so they end up having to pay for it when they go to college and take remedial classes, which is uh, really not where you want to be. Um, you you want to put your money and your student loans on classes that count and classes that will get you to a certificate or a degree. Um, and then you, you really want to be able to uh, present yourself well and speak well. And uh, that's another skill that when you interview, um, you know, I've interviewed lots of people and um, some people are very unsuccessful when they interview because they don't have good speaking skills. And it's something that you don't just wake up one day and click on Zoom and start interviewing. You should rehearse it. And people like Jasmine and the team over there at Workforce Solutions, that's what their job is, is to help people get prepared for the interview. Because the interview is kind of a very uh, artificial and strange environment that you don't do every day in life. And that means you need to train a little bit for it, too. So I've learned a good interview is very, very important to get your foot in the door, to get uh, moving forward. Um, and uh, I see a lot of people that don't have those skills. What do you think is the best career decision that you ever made to get to where you're at right now? I think the best career decision, I know the best career decision I ever made was taking that GED class for $11 an hour. Um, it was out of desperation um, because I really needed a job. Um, but it was also something where uh, I could have taken other jobs and I did have other jobs. I worked at a bookstore for a while and I did some other things, but I knew if I was, in front of people talking, I knew I liked to teach. Um, it wasn't the subject matter I wanted to teach at the time. I didn't even know what the GED was. When I interviewed for the class, the lady said, well, we've got a class opening to teach the GED. And I asked her, I said, well, what is that? Because um, I didn't know what the GED was. I was uh, a college, you know, I was uh, went to college and was going to be an ancient history teacher. Um but that was the best decision I made because it, it transformed my life um, and changed my life. Um, so there, you know, I had a really desperate situation um, and everybody in life, you're going to run across desperate situations. You're going to have a challenge uh, in your life. And, um, but I, I, I kept my eyes open and my ears open and my options open. And I jumped at something that uh, on the surface might not have looked like the best decision, but it really worked out well for me. And, um, uh, that happens oftentimes because I knew it was going to a place that I was going to find enrichment and I was going to find some excitement, which was teaching. 
Mr. Green, thank you again for taking the time to complete this interview. The information is extremely valuable and it's going to impact a lot of lives. Guys, if you're interested in learning more about this career or any other career, feel free to check out Texas Reality Check, Texas Career Check, Own It, or Career Coach. And now those links can be found on our website, wfsolutions.org. Thank you very much again, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Green, we appreciate that. Uh, thank you to Jasmine for that as well. But we hope that you enjoyed uh, Mr. Green's interview. And for any educators that are on the call or listening on YouTube, uh, please know that all of these interviews are going to be placed in our library and will be on demand. So if you and your school are having a career fair and are going virtual with that and are needing presentations, these videos will be available to you. Uh, upon uh, request, you just need to send us an email uh, at either david at wfsolutions.org or you can reach us at getempowered at wfsolutions.org. So with no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and transfer, uh, uh, start showing a uh, Dr. Patrick Wilby. We're going to be going to the health care industry. Our next two presenters will be representing healthcare. So if you're interested in that, we have these individuals coming in. The first one will be Patrick Wilby. And let me go ahead and get him on started. Patrick Wilby is a dentist with experience in treating patients of all ages, including children. He graduated dental school in Washington, D.C. from Howard University. After finishing school, he completed a one-year residency specializing in implants, pediatric dentistry, and medically compromised patients. He enjoys attending community events and helping others. In his free time, he enjoys reading, CrossFit, and hanging out with family. Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Hernandez and I'm a Workforce Outreach Specialist with Workforce Solutions. Today with us, we have Dr. Patrick Wilby who will be giving us some information on his profession. Dr. Wilby, can you please introduce yourself, your job title and where you currently work? Hey guys, I'm Dr. Patrick Wilby. Um, I currently work in three locations, well two, Alton and Mission, uh, and I'm a dentist. So Dr. Wilby, how did you become interested in this occupation? There's so many different job titles under the medical field, why did you decide to be a dentist? That's a really good question. Um, I actually became a dentist because I had a great uh, relationship with my dentist growing up. Uh, he knew me, he knew my family, he knew when my father came in, when my brother came in, and he felt like an extension of my family. So um, that naturally kind of just jolted me into like looking into doing it. Uh, and then as I got older, I kind of started working backwards and I was like, well, I don't want to be a lawyer because I hate writing things. And I was like, I, I can't be an architect because I hate creating things. I'm not that good. Um, so I kind of naturally found my way in the medical field. And then dentistry came about because of that great relationship that I had with my dentist. And I, I decided to do dentistry. That's super awesome. What type of education or what kind of education, training or background does your job require? So to become a dentist, it does take a while. Um, of course, you have to do four years of undergrad. And then after that, dental school is four years. Um, and then if you plan on doing a residency to be able to specialize in certain aspects of dentistry, it could take maybe a year or two years up to a whole nother four years of school. So maybe total eight years or so. So you did state that you have to do four years of undergrad. What was your undergrad uh, degree? Um, my undergrad degree was in biology. I started off as a chemist major and I was like, eh, I don't know. Uh, and, and I switched over to biology and I loved it. And I ended up graduating with a biology degree. Awesome. What skills, abilities, and personal attributes are essential to, su uh, to success in your job or your field? Um, well, the first thing, of course, is attitude. Uh, you have to want to uh, get things done, uh, stay focused. Um, of course, your grades are going to have to be great. 
Um, be a good listener because if your patients are talking, you don't want to be the type of person or a type doctor that's speaking over your patients or not listening to what they're saying. Um, so being a great listener is important. Uh, and you also just want to be able to have that heart to help people. Um, being being one of someone who wants to reach out to the community and help people, um, that's a big aspect of the job as well. Do you feel that if somebody does not have the heart for it, that it would be more difficult to actually do that job? Yeah, a reason why I would say that is because it gets rough. <laughs> it does get rough from time to time. Uh, and if you don't absolutely love it, it can take a toll on you, right? Um, even with me, I love it. And there's some days where I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I can't do another day. Um, but then when I remember why I started and what I did, what I'm doing it for is to help people. And you see the smile that you put on people's faces when they're in pain and you get them out of pain. Or um, just like yesterday, I had a patient and she's brought in her mom and her sister and her cousin. And I think it's like four or five people that came in and it just feels good to know that um, people trust you that much to continue to bring their family members in. So that's pretty much what really keeps you going. I bet that makes you feel really good. Yeah. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel real good that you're helping them. Yeah. Yep. What does your typical work day look like? What are the day-to-day -day responsibilities of your position? What kind of problems do you encounter daily? Well, for me specifically, um, I could go on and on. The list doesn't stop. <laughs> and that's because I'm a dentist and I own my own practice. So I kind of have two issues going on. One is the clinical side where you're dealing with patients every single day. And then as an owner, it's the business side. But um, if I were to just stick strictly with just the dental part, uh, the th kind of things that you have to deal with every day is making sure you're doing your charts every morning or after the patient leaves, uh, making sure you're looking over everything before people come in so that you're prepared and you're not like um, unprepared when they come in. Um, long hours, making sure that your staff are on the same page. Those are important, having staff meetings in the morning. Um, a lot of different things that you would need to do in order to be in order to be prepared for the morning. Okay, and then what problems do you encounter? What are some of the typical problems that you've seen or something that you can control and sometimes it just gets out of hand? Well, the first thing, the first part is the clinical part, right? So sometimes people come in and they have, let's say a tooth that hurts, right? Uh, and you try to give them their options and you say, hey, we can do this to fix the tooth or we can do that and we can take it out. Uh, and sometimes the body kind of makes its own decision. <laughs> so sometimes you'll say, okay, well, we think this is going to happen. Uh, and it totally turned out into a different, you know, a different scenario. So that happens a lot. And you can't really get frustrated about that. Sometimes it's just, you know, you plan for one thing with the patient and it actually goes the other way. Um, so I always kind of let patients know that that can kind of go any which way. So don't get, you know, bent out of shape if we plan to do something. And then later on, we have to switch to something else. Um, so that becomes a problem from time to time because patients are like, well, I thought we were going to do this. And I'm like, yeah, but your body's doing this. So <laughs> we got to kind of change tracks in order to make sure things work well. So that's a problem that happens from time to time. Uh, another problem is communication, right? Um, sometimes you send a patient to another doctor and then that doctor is saying something different than what you were saying. And you kind of got to call the doctor, make sure both of you guys are on the same page and we're just saying the same thing to the patient uh, and they don't feel confused and they understand what their treatment plan is. Um, and all of those things can happen while you're working. So you'll be working and then they'll knock on the door and, hey, doc, can you, you know, pick up line one? And I'm like, I can't do line one right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm busy right now. If you give me five minutes, I can. So all of those things, you've got to really know how to multitask is what I'm saying is that's the biggest problem is the multitask part because a lot of that, a lot of those issues come up. Yeah, and I, I bet that it can be hard. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what are some of the decisions that you make daily? How do you make those decisions? So the first thing I would say about decisions is having a great team behind you. I would never, I'd be lying to you if I told you that all decisions I make come straight through me and they don't. Uh, I have a really, really, really good team around me and they've been in the dental field for years and years. Um, so they normally make the decision and I review it <laughs> and they'll come and they'll say, hey, I think we need to do this or I think we need to do that. And I'll take a look at it and we'll say, OK, yeah, I think that's the right way to do it. Or if I have an issue with it, I'll kind of speak my piece and say, hey, you know, I think that we need to change this decision or change what we did here. And in terms of decisions, it can be anything. It can be from marketing to how many hours people are working for a week to a patient complaint or anything. So um, a lot of those decisions, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made on a daily basis. 
Um, in my office behind me, I have like a big whiteboard. It's about like eight feet or 10 feet wide. A big and, whiteboard. Yeah, it's, big. <laughs> it's gigantic. And we put a lot of our, um, a lot of the issues or ongoing problems that we have on there and we make decisions from there. So like when we first come in in the morning, we review the board, we see exactly what needs to be done. And then we kind of just break the work up and I'll say, okay, hey, you know, you're going to take this part of the work. You'll take this part of the work. You'll take this part. And then anything that I have to do, then I'll do it. And I'll get half of it done in the morning and the other half in the afternoon after the patients leave. Okay. So uh, I, I keep on hearing you say a lot of communication. So communication is very, very important when it comes to your occupation. Yes. Yes. Can you tell me about your work? Uh, like in, in regards to work, um, can you tell me about a recent project that you've had? I know you were mentioning that you're going to renovate one of your offices as well. So that yeah. has to do with that. So can you explain a little bit on how that works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a, a new project that we're taking on right now is um, renovations of one of the offices. Um, the office hasn't been renovated in a while, maybe about five, 10 years or so. Um, so I'm in the middle of kind of like redesigning everything and getting everything torn out and gutted and everything. Uh, the project has been like a nightmare <laughs> because first thing is I'm terrible with uh, renovating things. So it's like you have to see everything as as it will be in the future, but looking at it right now, you know, so you're looking at walls that are going to move. You're looking at bathrooms that have to move. You're looking at like putting in new spaces you're looking at how the new operatory rooms are going to look for the patients when they come in. Um, but it doesn't look like that right now. So you have to kind of imagine all of those things in your mind. Um, so I've been working with this great contractor. He's been helping me to kind of see things and he has his iPad and he'll pull things up and he'll say, Hey, this is what it will look like. If we knock out this wall and we knock out that wall. Um, so the project has been fun so far. But it hasn't got started yet. Everything is kind of in the preliminary phases and we haven't uh, gotten a chance to actually do demolition and start knocking things down because that's when the not so fun part stuff happens when they'll tell you, oh, you know, uh, there's something going on with this wall or something going on with the electrical and this. And I know that there are going to be extra issues that kind of pop up. Um, but so far right now, so good. We, we plan on taking the operatory, I mean, taking the practice and adding some more areas in there for our patients. Um, so that they can be more comfortable. And, and especially now, like how we have um, Corona and COVID going around, I wanted to open up the um, patient area a little bit more so that people could be social distancing and, and, and feel safe in the office. So in regards to that, because it was something that you had planned, you have to actually plan with your staff as well when it comes to your patients. Did you plan it ahead where you did, did not schedule any patients during those two weeks or are you sending them to your other clinics? How did you deal with that or how are you going to deal with that? Yeah, so it's exactly like what you were saying. The way that we were looking at it is there's kind of like a two or three phase plan. Um, so the first one is for them to come in and do as much work as they can do without shutting the office down. So small areas where patients aren't going to be was kind of like the first area for us to attack because then we won't have to shut it down while they're doing those parts. Then after that part is done is when we're actually going to do the real demolition uh, and that'll take two weeks and that'll have to shut down. And during that time, like how you were saying, uh, we will be sending most of our patients to our other office so that they can be seen there during those two weeks time. Um, and then after that two weeks time, uh, we'll uh, reevaluate at the end of that two weeks because we kind of made a pact that we wouldn't go past two weeks. Um, so at that two week time is when everything that needs to be functional should be working at that point. <laughs> so we'll yeah. see everything theoretically sounds good. Fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> Keeping our fingers crossed. It sounds good so far. Uh, so theoretically, everything within the two weeks that should be functioning right, right will be done. And then the last maybe week or so will just be for like touch-ups, minor stuff, like maybe touch up with the paint, touch up with certain areas, maybe, you know, putting a little molding here and there. So it should just be the minor thing. So it's really like a three week, four week process, but the real heavy stuff should be done in two weeks. Okay. And again, fingers crossed. Everything fingers crossed. And <laughs> what do you find more the most, like what aspect of your job is it the most challenging or the most rewarding or so, and the most rewarding? Yeah, so I would say the challenging part is really all of this decisions. You speak a lot about decisions a lot. Uh, you do have to make a lot, a lot of decisions. And um, it feels like sometimes you're running a thousand miles a second because your brain is like thinking about a million things. You're thinking about your patient. You're thinking about, you know, how many hours did all the employees work today and, da, 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 and all of those things are kind of like going through your brain, going through your brain. Uh, so if you don't 
take the time to detox, it will like drive you crazy. <laughs> so some days I will, you know, after work, go to the gym or after work, go for a walk. I do like going for walks. That helps a lot. Like before I used to think that was really cheesy. Like, oh, who's going for a walk? Like, no, you know, you definitely want to like, but now I find myself doing it all the time and it just helps me think. And I, I end up walking a lot at nighttime, like, well, well not night, but after dark, when the sun kind of goes down. When you um, get out of work. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. When I get out of work, I'll walk. And it'll help me to kind of just detox and kind of unbundle all of the decisions that I had to make uh, and kind of like recap and say, okay, was that a good decision? Was that a bad decision? What am I going to do differently? Um, Self-evaluation, self-reflection is very important. So you kind of know where you're going uh, because a lot of times you'll make a lot of those decisions. And and if you do it like on an ongoing basis, you feel like you're just spinning in circles. You're like, man, am I moving forward, backwards? I don't know what's going on in my life. It's just a lot coming at one time. Um, so I would say that that's by far the most challenging part. Um, also, dentistry can be really taxing on your body. Uh, when you're a physician, uh, normally you're walking from room to room. You have a clipboard. You're prescribing medication. And, and most of the uh, work that you're doing is mental. Um, but in dentistry, you're you're really doing physical work. You know, you're pulling out people's teeth. You're you're leaning over over your back. So um, there's a lot of dentists that have like um, back issues that they'll have from time to time. Sometimes uh, dentists can get like carpal tunnel syndrome issues with their hands uh, because you're doing extractions and everything for years and years. Um, I've seen certain people lose certain um, functions of certain fingers because they've been using oh, it for wow. so long. Yeah, 30 years, 40 years doing extractions a certain way, and then they're not able to close their hand. Um, so it it will, it can take a toll on your body, uh, totally different than any other, I, I guess, medical practice that you would, you would be able to go into. So that'll happen. Um, so that's kind of like the negative parts. Um, the positive part really is just changing people's lives. You know, when when they come in and they trust you uh, and pe- family members are bringing other family members because they trust you, it really makes you feel good. Um, and you know that you're changing a community and that always feels great um, to help someone who's in help, who's in need. And um, they come to you because they could have went to anyone else. They could have went to another dentist. They could have went somewhere else. Um, so when they come and choose you, it does it does make you feel a lot better, a whole lot better. And we have... Uh, we've been blessed that um, pretty much in the three practices that I own, uh, all of our all of our patients are really grateful. They're never like, oh, well, I'll come and da, da, da. They're really grateful for all the work that we do. And it makes you feel even better. It makes you feel a lot better. So I did hear you state that you like to walk after work. And so that's your work and your personal life balance. Is it yeah. easy for you to turn on and off that switch where you're like, okay, I'm out of the office. I'm going to turn it off and I'm just going to be at peace, just relax. Is it hard for you or is it difficult? Super hard. I would be lying to you if I told you I can turn that switch off. Never. It, the switch never goes off for me. Uh, it, uh, there's always something. There's times when I wake up in the middle of the night, like, oh, did I do this? That, and, that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still thinking about that. And it's, it's a weakness of mine. I'm not going to lie. I don't think it's true for every dentist or every business owner. I think some people do have that switch and they know how to have that really nice balance. Um, but for me, I don't. I really don't. <laughs> so, like, even my birthday just passed September the 18th. And uh, happy belated birthday. Thank you. Thank you. And we went to uh, my brother surprised me and he came um, out here from Philadelphia to come see me. And my cousin as well, he came down to see me and we ended up driving to Houston. And it was funny, all, all the way up there, I'm driving and then I'm still having flashbacks like, oh, did I do that in the office? Did I do this? Did I do that? So, my mind is still on. Um, very, the only time that I think I can kind of detox the most and kind of turn off the switches, maybe on a Sunday, Sundays are probably like the only days where I really just kick my feet up and go to sleep and, you know, whatever happens on that day is fine. But, um, every other day, always my brain is still connected to it. So, um, I'm, I'm, that's a weak point. That's definitely a weak point for me. <laughs> I, I, I feel you. I know that. <laughs> how does success look in your position and how do you measure it? Well, everyone measures success differently. Um, but for me specifically, I just measure success by um, the environment that I'm creating around myself, right? Uh, a lot of times I've been in, I've worked in a lot of different dental offices. Before I became a dentist, I had a lot of different jobs. And uh, sometimes you go into certain work cultures and it's real negative and people are saying things that are not nice and people aren't helping each other and everyone's watching the clock like, oh, I've been here for eight hours. I'm ready to go. Or what time does lunch start? I'm ready to go. 
Uh, and that's always a culture or an environment that I never really liked. Um, so success to me has always been about being in a culture or being in a work environment where everyone is, is happy, right? Uh, you can't make everyone happy all the time, so that would be a lie. Um, but when you have a positive environment where everyone is at least trying to help each other, everyone brings each other up, um, and that has been uh, a great success in my offices. I can't, I can't really lie a lot. Every staff member that I work with every day, I'm excited to come to work. So it's not something where I wake up in the morning and I'm dragging and I'm like, oh my God, why well, I got to go back into this place again. <laughs> uh, it's been great. And I've found that that positive energy translates a lot to our patients. Uh, because there's sometimes when they wait because, you know, I'm in a million different rooms and they might be waiting in a room for 20 minutes or 15 minutes or 30, whatever time. Um, but when I enter the room, the positive energy comes back and they're like, hey, how the hi, dog, how are you doing? And the energy gets back up again. And uh, that has been a great success. And, and that's how I measure my success is how happy people are around me um, and that we're moving towards a goal together. So that that's been that's been great. It's been great. And I, I completely agree with you. So I know that you're a dentist. So what other individuals work with you? Uh, what are their roles and how do you all work together? Okay. All right. So um, as a dentist, you pretty much have a big team. Uh, well, small team, depending on what you're measuring your business against. <laughs> uh, we have the dentist, of course, which is uh, making all the decisions in the back. Uh, you have a dental assistant. And the dental assistant is really an extension of the dentist, right? Uh, so when you're working and you're seeing patients, you're pretty much you, the dentist and the dental assistants are pretty much working hand in hand. And if you've worked with a dental assistant for long enough, they'll pretty much know what you want before you even open your mouth. So <laughs> so as soon as you get in the room and you start talking to the patient, when you're dead, like especially like my assistants, they're all in sync with what I say and what I do. And before I even speak, they have everything ready. If I'm going to get a referral, they already have the referral written up and blah, blah, blah. And all I have to do is review it and sign it. If you we're call them, do, okay, if I touch my eyebrow, that means referral. If I touch exactly. <laughs> they know. They know all of my signals, all my cues. If I say I'm going to do treatment, they have everything lined up. Like while I'm speaking, everything gets set up. Um, so dental assistants, when they're plugged in, it is excellent. So the dental assistant and the dentist work together. Um, in addition to that, you'll have a dental hygienist. Um, and I, we just hired one a few months ago, maybe like three or four months ago. Um, her name is Emma. She is excellent. And she has been like such a great addition to the office as well. And she's a provider. So a dental, a dental hygienist um, performs some of the functions of what a dentist would do. They do um, deep cleanings, right? Uh, and normally a dentist, a dentist can do a deep cleaning. Uh, hygienists are way better at it. <laughs> So that, that's what they're trained to do. And that's what they do 24 seven. So we hired one because of our, our patient population is a little bit older. And most people who need deep cleanings are, are older. And when I say older, maybe older than 40, 50 years old is normally when you run into people who need deep cleanings. Um, and a majority of our patient pool has that. So we hired Emma. Uh, and she has come on board and like the patients love her. So now I come into the room. And sometimes they're like, Oh, so where's the other girl? And I'm like, who are you guys talking about? Oh, Emma. Yeah, Emma. How's she doing? So now they're asking for her and they, they want to see her. And I'm like, hey, I got to do all your feelings and stuff. But they want to see her every day. So it's it's been great. She treats them well. So you have the dental hygienist, the dentist, the dental assistant. Uh, and then you have the front staff, which is extremely important. Very, very important. I don't want to I don't want to um, make them seem less than the rest of the team. They are as important or maybe even more. Uh, so normally we have two front staff front desk um, staff members, uh, and their job is to check people in, uh, get the insurances together, all of that not so fun stuff. Sometimes they're on the phone talking to insurance companies for like a whole 30 minutes while they're on hold and everything. Uh, so you have those two aspects of it. We also have a scheduler in our office. So the scheduler's job is to keep our schedule full. So they're calling patients, calling, and it kind of feels like a call center. So they call, call, call all day long. <laughs> so we try to give them chances to get breaks every 15 minutes to stand up, walk around, stretch their legs out. Because when you're sitting and calling people all day long, it does get real terrible. So I feel for them, but their job is really important as well. Um, and then the last, which is the most important is the manager. And uh, my manager is Lorena. 
Uh, and I couldn't, she's like my right arm, left arm, neck. She's everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, I don't know anything and she knows everything. So anytime I have a question, you just ask her. It's almost like Google. She just type it in and just know all the answers. And uh, she is just, she coordinates everything. Everything is coordinated through her. Um, and she helps me every single day. There's things that I can't do because I'm busy. And she takes care of, of pretty much the, all three of the offices. So um, the manager's position is very important. So in terms of the people we work with, it's going to be the dentist, dental assistant, two front staff members normally are what, what you're going to see. A scheduler in the office is not always mandatory. Sometimes the front desk people will be doing the scheduling. It just so happens that I have it. Um, dental hygienist is important. Um, not all offices have it, but um, I, I was blessed enough to have it. Uh, and then a manager. Normally, there's always a manager in a dental office. So that's, those are pretty much the people that you'll work with. So a lot of teamwork and again, a lot of communication. Yes, yes, yes. So what would you recommend students in high school and college to do to prepare for this career field? Any recommendations regarding education for this position? Yeah, what I would what I would recommend first is to find your nearest dentist and go shadow and see exactly whether you like it or you don't like it. Right. Uh, spend time with that because it is, you know, eight years of schooling. So that takes a while to get there. So you kind of want to get a feel for it before you commit to that. Um, the next thing I'd recommend is um, commitment. Right. Uh, for you to get to this level, it's one of those things that you have to believe in yourself and you have to know that you're going to get it done. Uh, I would always tell the people that are most positive in your life, you know, what you plan on doing. Don't tell it to someone who you know is going to say a naysayer or oh, I don't think you're going to do it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, because you're going to need everyone to kind of like, you know, push you through uh, when the times get hard and you're taking hard classes or maybe you failed a class and you have to take it again. Um, so you're going to need super people to kind of help build you back up. Um, I would recommend, um, of course, Go to a great college. Um, if you can go to a college that already has a dental school or medical school there, that makes it way easier because then you don't have to transfer from one college to another. You'll be in one that already has one. Um, so that helps out a lot. Uh, Was that and the case I, for you? What happened? Was that the case for you? Were you already in a college or did you have to transfer? I had to transfer. So that's okay, how I know that one's gone. tougher. Yeah, that was the tougher route. <laughs> yeah, it's always easier when you go to a school that already has that. So in hindsight, I would have done it that way. Uh, in high school, of, of course, get good grades, you know, um, focus on that. Um, I would also recommend getting into extracurricular activities if you're not already in. So um, even though something like, you know, basketball, sports, anything. And the reason I recommend that is not because you need that in order to get in school, but it does teach you time management. Because what I've learned about school is like when you have other things going on, you'll learn how to manage your schoolwork with everything else. Uh, because when you get to this level, like where I'm at now, time management is everything. And if you haven't kind of learned how to do that at a young age, it's going to be tough when you're trying to learn it at my age. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm the, le I'm the lesson of what not to do. Don't do it the way I did it. If I could go backwards, I would definitely get involved in extracurricular activities. And that kind of helps to balance your life. Cause you'll know how to, you know, um, set, set apart time to still be successful. Awesome. So what other factors besides education and experience impact the ability to work in the position that you work in? For example, does somebody have to have a good credit, a clean background, availability to travel, uh, working outside or inside, or maybe working outside of the normal business hours of Monday through Friday, eight to five? Yes. So, yeah. So to answer that, it's almost yes, yes, and yes. To all of, them. <laughs> uh, of check, course, check. yeah, check, 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 check. Of course, you have to have a great background, right? No criminal stuff, because uh, the board will never let you on if you have that going on. Uh, second thing is, uh, in terms of hours, I don't leave until the patients leave. And that's true for the whole clinical team. Uh, the front staff team, there's probably like one or two per people that have to stay after the rest of them can kind of leave when they're, when they're scheduled to leave. Um, but in terms of your hours, you just don't know. There's days where I come home early at uh, five o'clock, four o'clock. There's days where I come home late eight o'clock. Um, so being flexible with your time is very, very important. Um, being able to travel, of course, maybe a little bit uh, if you're going to move towards uh, different offices and work in different offices, then yeah. Um, I would say that you do have to have uh, good hand-eye coordination because when you're drilling in people's mouths and stuff, you can't. You don't want to. 
Yeah, you don't want to move stuff in and hurt people. So, yeah, if you're one of those people that can't keep your hands still, then maybe not a good profession to look into. Um, you also, that's, that's pretty much it. I would, I would say that those are the major things that, that you should have. Is there anything else that you think that the students should know about being a dentist or any advice or tips or anything that can come into mind? Um, the only advice I would say about being a dentist is that, um, on one thing that I didn't know, or I guess I'm learning right now is it is very demanding in terms of, uh, every minute of the day that you're in the office, it, it, it requires all of your attention. Um, so it's not like in school where, you know, I've, everyone's been through school, your teacher's talking and you're just kind of scribbling on a piece of paper and you're kind of like, eh, I hear, her, but you know, I'm doing this right now. And it gives you a chance to kind of unplug for a second. Uh, in this profession, you don't really have a chance to unplug. You're going to kind of be in, in the grind all day long. Um, so that's something that I, I kind of like calculated, but didn't really calculate. So uh, as I, as I'm in it now, there's nothing I can do, but uh, you are kind of always plugged into what you're doing at all times. So uh, it is important to either build that kind of mentality to learn how to be focused for a certain amount of time. I'm not saying you have to be like that the whole day, but uh, even if it's something where you do some kind of work with your hands or whatever for at least a two hours, three hours straight to kind of build up your mental strength so that you can continue through the day and things will come at you and you can still kind of stay plugged in. Uh, because when you're seeing patients and you're dealing with people's health and lives and stuff, you just got to make sure that you're paying very close attention. Uh, and you can't like plug out and just say, Hey, I don't feel like dealing with this right now. You know, tell that patient to call back next week or something. You can't, can't do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I imagine <laughs> Because it could happen where they take um, pay time off from work and they're yeah. expecting to see you. And then, for that to happen, I bet that it would upset some of the patients. Oh, yeah. And that <laughs> happens. Oh, and that happens. There's times where patients come in and they're like, hey, you know, we wanted to do this, this, that, and the third today. And I'll come into the room and I'll look and I'll say, hey, I can't do this. You're going to have to go to a, a specialist to take care of that, you know, because that's outside of my expertise. And their face kind of just drops, you know, <laughs> and they're like, oh, my God, I took off of work to come here and blah, blah, blah. And I had to move my kids around and drop them over my aunt's house. And then and I understand that. So um, as, a, as a doctor, I do my best to try to do everything that I can do. Um, but there's times where, you know, I'm not Superman. So there's certain things where I'm like, I just, I can't. And, um, so you're right that, that, that can become a major problem. Maybe close to it. You're close to being Superman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So it's one of those things where you want to do everything you can. Cause if you, if you don't, and you're kind of like, eh, you know, come back next week, you, whew, you're going to get a bad reputation really fast. Yeah, yeah, especially when it comes to customer service. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Wilby, thank you again for taking the time for this interview. The information you shared is extremely valuable and will impact the lives of those viewing this video. And thank then for you. everybody that's watching, if you are interested in learning about this career or any other careers, feel free to explore Texas Reality, Texas Reality Check, which will allow you to determine if that occupation will uh, meet your financial needs later in the future. You can also explore Texas Career Check, ONET, and career coach to dig deeper into certain careers. So the links to those websites are noted are under our Workforce Solutions webpage that can be found under wfsolutions.org. And we, as you can see them, they are up here in the this site in the corner. Thank you very much and thank you for watching. Thank you everyone for listening in. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and transition over to our next uh, presenter, um, Mr. Herrera. But before we do that, just a reminder again to all the educators on the call, uh, if you are planning a future virtual career fair and are needing speakers and you're gonna do this, uh, your fair virtually, all these uh, interviews that we have been showing since Monday all the way up until tomorrow, will be in our library and are available to you upon request. Uh, today, this is our last session. Tomorrow is our last day where we will have uh, four more interviews with employers, and then we'll have a closing uh, keynote, uh, Mr. Martinez White. So if any of you were able to listen to him on Monday, he brings a lot of energy. We're excited about him closing out the, the conference with a lot of energy that he brought. Uh, so we're hoping that you are able to join tomorrow. 
and we're looking forward to it. So with no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and transfer the uh, share screens and we can start seeing Mr. Herrera. Mr. Adele was raised in McAllen, Texas. He graduated from McAllen High School in 2002, then completed his undergraduate education in 2006 at the University of Texas, Pan American, with a bachelor's degree in pre-med biology. He then graduated from University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in 2010 before completing an inter internal medicine residency and gastroenterology fellowship. He practiced gastroenterology Ology in the Rio Grande Valley since 2016. Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Hernandez and I'm a Workforce Outreach Specialist with Workforce Solutions. Today with me, we have Dr. Henry R. Herrera Jr. who will be giving us some information on his profession. Dr. Herrera, can you please introduce yourself and your job title? Sure thing, Jasmine. My, my name is Henry Herrera. Uh, I am a gastroenterologist uh, here in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I'm originally from this area, so I uh, grew up in McAllen, Texas. Uh, I did all my schooling through McAllen ISD, um, went to uh, University of Texas Pan American, which it was called Pan Am at that time. I graduated in 2006. Um, and then after that, I went and did my medical school in Dallas. Um, I finished my medical training in 2010. And then, you know, after you finish medical school, you do what's called uh, residency training. And so you, you have to decide what kind of doctor you're going to be. So uh, I did mine in what's called internal medicine, which is the practice of, uh, of uh, medicine primarily in adults. Um, and then after that, I decided to specialize in, in gastroenterology, which is the, the study of all the uh, organs that are involved in digestion. So your, you know, your esophagus, your stomach, your uh, intestines, your pancreas, your gallbladder, your liver. Um, and so it's, it's a but it's a lot of different uh, things. And so it's kind, of, it's kind of exciting for me to get to do this every day. But, um, you know, the, the best thing about it is being able to come back to the Valley and, and, and uh, uh, take care of the uh, community. Out of all the fields that are out there under the medical field or all, all of, out of all the occupations, why did you decide the one that you picked? So, you know, I, I'll say that back when I was in medical school, I wasn't 100 percent sure what I wanted to do. And, you know, all you really know uh, you know, I, I don't come from from any uh, uh, medical uh, uh, doctors. No, you know, I don't have any family members who, who are physicians. And so, for me, really, the only medicine or what I thought was was uh, the life of a doctor was kind of seeing through TV and kind of hearing it. And so, I, I used to think that doing emergency medicine was something that I want to do, but I kind of imagined it being a little bit different than than uh, than what it was. And so, you know, once you start rotating through all the the different professions, you start seeing kind of uh, the um, things you like about one things you don't like so you know i went through emergency medicine like some aspects of it but um they do a lot of shift work which is great for for people who who are into uh, you know coming in at a certain time leaving at a certain time um i you know to an extent i, I like that but uh, i also went through um rotation in internal medicine and in internal medicine you get to see the patient in the hospital, obviously, when they come in. But but in addition to that, you get to follow up with them in the clinic. And that, that was something that was really important to me to be able to establish that relationship after seeing them in the hospital. And, and you know, not just seeing them uh, when they're at their sickest, but also seeing what happens when you when you treat them and, and seeing how, how they improve. And, you know, if they don't improve, what, what it was that you did um, that uh, that maybe didn't do um, the job and, and, and how to improve on that the next time. And so getting that rapport, getting that communication and that trust built. Um, gastroenterology in particular, once I decided that I wanted to do internal medicine, uh, I started noticing that, that to me, um, those particular organs stood out and, and, and doing the exams in medical school, they seemed a little bit easier to me. And, and again, it, it really just depends on your personality um, and, and, you know, what it is that, that sort of drives you. But for me, I really enjoyed the idea of being able to follow with my patients uh, in clinic seeing them in the hospital, and then the idea of being able to do endoscopic procedures. And so you kind of almost have the feeling that you're doing a surgery, um, but uh, in a, minim a minimally invasive way. And so that, that was awesome. And then just the idea of being able to go in there and, and take care of something um, as emergent as a, a, you know, a massive internal bleed 
Um, and then the next day seeing somebody for something like, you know, gastritis or reflux or, or just kind of the, the bread and butter of medicine. And so it, it's just that, that, that breadth and the, the um, diversity that you get in GI is something that I really loved. That's awesome. What skills, abilities, and personal attributes are essential to success in your field? So I think, you know, a lot of personal drive is, is really important. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I don't, I don't know that I've ever met a, a, a doctor, certainly not a successful doctor that goes into this wanting to uh, basically just make money. I mean, you really have to love this profession because it, it's not something that you do eight to five. It becomes, it really becomes your life. Um, you, know, you, you go home, but uh, you, you get calls all the time from nurses, from your partners, you get calls from the hospital, from patients. And so it's something that becomes more of a lifestyle. Um, so, you, you know, you really have to go into it knowing that it, it, it's going to dramatically change your life and hopefully for the better. And if it's something that you really love doing, you know, you, you love taking care of patients, you love um, seeing, you know, people get better. Um, you love having that communication. Um, then I think it's something that, that you should look into. But um, the main thing that you have to have is, is that personal drive and, and the ability to, to get through, uh, obviously, schooling and doing well in school. But, but once you leave your local community, leaving and going to doing, you know, whether it's just your undergrad or, or moving on once you go into medical school like I did, um, going to medical school uh, as far as as far away as I did from from home, you know, you have to um, have that ability to, to adapt. Um, School is very different uh, in, in different places. And so for me, um, I, I, I feel like I got great training here in, at UT uh, Pan American, but it was a whole other ball game once I got into medical school. And so the ability to not only adapt, um, but also be able to pick yourself up whenever you, you know, you, I, I had one, one of my first exams was, uh, I think I ended up getting like a 75 on it. It was one of the worst grades I'd ever had. And I was shocked because I'd been studying as hard as I thought I could. Uh, and it really kind of changed the way I, I, I studied, I, you know, I became, it became something that was more of a, of a full-time thing. I mean, I, I, I thought about it as a full-time job, you know, studied 40 plus hours a week in addition to going to school. And, and so um, a lot of personal drive, a lot of personal drive, I think is really important. What does a typical work day look like for you? Is it the same every day? Does it change from day to day? Uh, so in general, I think, so when you're in training, I think your 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 day looks much different than once you get into uh, into practice. So it, you know, I, I kind of think of it in a way as you put in a lot of hours um, in in training. Um, you know, it wasn't um, out of the ordinary to to be working a hundred plus hours uh, per week. Um, oh, in addition to trying, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in addition to trying to study for your exams, and in, in addition to trying to you know, to eat and live, uh, so mm -hmm. it, it's it's it was really really pretty pretty busy and pretty brutal in medical school. But as you go along further and further, so once you get into residency, it's a little bit different. You still you're still working hard. Um, and then once you get into your specialized training, you're, you're, for me, it was gastroenterology. Um, the amount of hours goes down to maybe about 50 to 60 hours a week. Um, and then now I'm doing, you know, on average, probably about 40 to 50 hours. And, and it depends, uh, depending on, on the, the weekly schedule that I'm on. So, so me personally, we, we have weekly schedules. And so, you know, one week I may be covering only the clinic. And, and when that's the case, I work about, about eight to five or so. Um, keep in mind that we also do procedures. And so I'll do about a half day of clinic and then a half day of, of procedures. Um, but whenever we're covering the hospital, we have to not only do our usual clinic and endoscopy, but we also have to go over to the hospital and take care of the patients that are there. And so that, that adds a few hours per day. Uh, but I would say on average, about 40 to 50 hours a week currently. Okay. So what type of problems do you encounter daily or every once in a while? Uh, in terms of, in terms of patient, uh, presentation or just in terms of the day-to-day the -day life? And let's say for a patient, like what would be a problem that you would encounter with a patient that's common for somebody sure. in your position? Sure. So one of the most common uh, complaints is stomach pain. And, and, you know, stomach pain can be related to something from a GI standpoint, and it can be completely, completely different. It can be a heart attack. It can be, um, it can be a problem with your, with your vessels. It can be something as simple as constipation. It can be an ulcer. Um, but, you know, that's usually one of the most common complaints is stomach pain. Um, reflux is also an issue. And, um, you know, here in, here in the Rio Grande Valley, um, the Hispanic culture, you know, our, our diet is, is very high in carbohydrates. 
rates and, and, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of us will, will go to, you know, um, the panaderias and, and, you know, we'll go get, I'm that, yes, I'm that person. That's right. Especially right now with football season, even, even with, uh, you know, with, with COVID and the pandemic, I mean, a lot of people still like to go to the ba- the backyard and, and cook for themselves. And um, so a lot of, you know, greasy foods, a lot of, a lot of uh, carbohydrates, breads, those lend themselves to, to a lot of gastrointestinal complaints and problems. And so, you know, uh, stomach pain, reflux, um, bloating, those are very, very common um, in constipation. So what are some decisions that you have to make daily? Is it based on your assessment of the patient that you decide what procedures they have to go through or what test? Definitely. Yeah. So a a lot of it has uh, a lot to do with, with the the clinical presentation and the way you ask questions. And so again, something as simple as stomach pain, I mean, it could be a life-threatening emergency if they come in and they can't even stand up straight, if they're folded over in pain, if they're in tears, that's a big difference as compared to somebody who comes in saying that they get a little bit bloated after eating, you know, tacos or something. And so, so uh, just because it's the same complaint doesn't mean that it's the same problem. Um, so the, the decisions that we make have a lot to do with, with what the patient tells us. So asking all the good questions, all the right questions makes a huge difference. Um, you know, basic questions, that, regardless of the symptom is, you know, when did this start? What does it feel like? How long does it last? Does it come and go? Or is it constant? Have, have you lost any weight? Does the pain wake you up in the middle of the night? Um, have you noticed any bleeding? So all these things, it kind of paints a picture as to as to what could be going on. And, and you know, without actually going in and looking with, with our cameras or without getting a CAT scan, a lot of it is just very, very educated guesses. Um, but there's also a pattern to it. And I think that's the reason that you call it uh, the practice of medicine is that, you know, you start seeing patterns in the way people um, describe certain, certain complaints. And so, you know, you go by those patterns in addition to what you get in the history to make a decision as to whether or not you need to bring him into the hospital, uh, whether you need to bring him in for an endoscopy, um, and how urgently you need to do it. Uh, sometimes it's it's easy enough to just get labs and tell them you know we'll see them we'll see them for results in a couple of weeks. But sometimes it's something that that requires a uh, an ambulance to transfer him over across the street to the hospital. Okay, so can you tell me about a procedure that you normally do, uh, or one of the more, uh, one of the most common procedures that you do? Yeah, so so we do um, upper endoscopies, or they're also called EGDs, and so those uh, procedures are done um, for a lot of different issues: uh, stomach pains, um, you know, loss of appetite, um, nausea. Um, patients can complain about reflux, trouble swallowing, um, bleeding. Uh, we, so we do we do endoscopies. Uh, upper endoscopies pretty often. I mean, I'd say on a on an average non-COVID pandemic kind of day, you know, it, it wasn't uncommon for me to do 10 plus upper endoscopies. Um, and then we also do colonoscopies. And so that's what's, what a lot of people sort of know the gastroenterologist for is for, for colon cancer screening and, and doing colonoscopies. And so that's a procedure where we go in through the bottom, through the rectum, and we're looking in the colon uh, for um, abnormalities in the, in the intestine. So um, looking for cancers, looking for um, polyps, which are, are precancerous little growths, um, but also looking for sources of bleeding, looking for inflammation, um, looking for you know internal hemorrhoids things can be caught ca- that, that can be causing um, fatigue and anemia and so uh, those are the two most common procedures that we do now there are um, more advanced procedures that, that require some time uh, the the assistance of uh, fluoroscopy or, or x-ray technology um, sometimes we we need the assistance of anesthesiologists to put the patient to sleep and uh, those procedures include things like ERCPs where we take out uh, gallbladder stones um, or we can uh, relieve blockages because of tumors or because of um, because of stones. Um, and then there's also something called an endoscopic ultrasound, which is a, an, endo, an ultrasound procedure, kind of like when they put jelly in your stomach and, and kind of use that, uh, that little machine to, to pull up that black and white image. So we, we can do that from the inside of uh, somebody's body. And, yeah. and it gives us a really good picture of the pancreas, of the liver, of the um, esophagus, of the, of the stomach. Um, the kidneys. I mean, we get, we get really, really good looks. And so if, if patients are coming in with a concern for a tumor or a mass, we can sample that uh, without having to cut them open. And so that's the beauty of endoscopy is being able to do these things non-invasively. So what aspect of your job do you find more challenging and what do you find more rewarding? So, um, you know, when it comes to challenging, I think, I think personally, uh, the challenge is trying to get 
everybody in in a timely manner. Um, you know, there's only a certain amount of hours in the day, and it's really difficult to to get everybody in the way you want to. I mean, ideally, you want to get everybody in on the same day, do the procedure the very next day. Um, it can be difficult, uh, not not just because of your schedule, but also because of um, insurance and because of having to go through all these all these obstacles and all these hurdles. And that 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 can be a, a frustrating situation, especially when you feel like some something needs to be done more urgently. Um, and then you get a call saying that the insurance doesn't cover it or the insurance is requiring other, you know, other studies beforehand, or, you know, you want them to be on a certain medicine, but the insurance recommends something else. And so th those sorts of things I think can be very frustrating, not just for the patients, but also for the, for the doctors. Um, something that I find obviously rewarding is, is having somebody come back and, and um, you know, uh, Whereas we had they had we not done a uh, procedure to stop a bleed, you know they may have potentially died. And so uh, one of the most rewarding things is seeing them in the in clinic and follow up and just seeing the relief and 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 them being happy that we were able to do something about it. Um, there's different you know types of 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 um, I guess success. You know you think about things like like major bleeds where where you go in there and you put a, you know, a, a clip or, or you stop something, you know, uh, on the spot, that's sort of a very, very immediate gratification. And patients tend to obviously remember that because it was a, they were on the verge of death and you saved their life kind of thing. But there's also other situations, chronic conditions, things like, like chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, um, inflammatory bowel disease, things like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease that you may not necessarily fix it all in one day, but, you know, you establish this relationship and over the course of two years, you can see a night and day difference from the way they were when they first came in as compared to when they, where they are today. And I think those are really, really gratifying because um, you remember what they were like um, and, and you really establish uh, a, a really close bond with your patients. I mean, you, you don't even have to look at their notes. You remember who they are. You remember them because of their stories, because of uh, things they tell you that are completely unrelated to their medical problems. I mean, they'll tell you about their family. They tell you about what they do. They tell you about how they do it. And, and you just, you remember their personalities more than, more than their personal history. And it, it, it helps you remember who they are. Um, so I think those are really the most gratifying things. Okay. Do you often work individually or are you more, are you part of a team? How would that work for somebody in your position? Sure. So we work, um, you know, as a gastroenterologist, you can choose to work privately. Um, you can work by yourself in, a, in an office. Uh, you can work in a group. Uh, if you work in a group, then you work with a collection of uh, other gastroenterologists. So that's that's currently what I do. Um, so, so to answer your question, you see patients individually, um, but when it comes to covering hospitals, when it comes to covering clinics, you work as a team um, in the sense that if you're not covering the hospital one week and your patient goes to the hospital, you may not be available. You may have, you know, taken vacation or, or for whatever reason, you, you're, you're not available to see the patient where well, your partner will cover them uh, and will see the patient for you. And so it's important to, to have teamwork um, among your partners. Uh, you know, we also work not just with other physicians, but also with other providers, uh, you know, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses, technicians, x-ray techs, anesthesia providers, surgeons. So, so the, the whole uh, practice of medicine and, and all the, um, all the members of, of, uh, of medicine play a huge role. And, and I think it's so important to have that relationship and that, and that friendship and, and having people's phone numbers and not just, you know, typing things on, on a computer and, and waiting for them to, to, to read it on their own. I mean, uh, every day we get, I get calls from, from different physicians and, and we communicate, you know, voice to voice or in person if they, if they come over to the office. Um, so it, it's very much a community uh, style of, of treatment when it comes to patients. And it's important to have relationships with not just people in your own uh, specialty, but also in all the other specialties, because at some point you're going to need them. And, it, and it's, it's great to be able to just call them up and know that they're going to be there for you. So teamwork and communication are extremely important for your position, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what does a typical work-life balance look for somebody in your position? Is it are you, do you have a balance when it comes to that? Is it a little bit more difficult? Are you able to turn off the switch and turn it on when you need to? Yeah. So, so I actually, you know, I, I have a, I do a social media page and, and I talked about this about a year or so ago, uh, cause I always thought it was so interesting, you know, what, what people consider to be a work-life balance. Um, so, so work-life balance to me is not 50-50. Um, it, it's not it, time-wise at least. It's not, it's not, you know, you spend 12 hours, uh, working in 12 hours doing something else. I mean, I, I think work-life balance varies so much from person to person, uh, from job to 
the job. And, and really, to me, the definition of work, work-life balance isn't so much the time, but the um, the gratification and the happiness in, in, in your life. And so, you know, there, there were days when I was in training that I was working, you know, 18 to 20 hours a day, and then I'd go home, take a couple hours nap, and then go right back uh, with very little time to be at home. Um, but eventually that does, that does even out. And so for me at that time, that was, that was the work-life balance was, was, you know, with a couple hours that I had per week to, to enjoy, I would enjoy it to, to the best of my ability. And, you know, I'd spend time with close friends, with, uh, with family, I'd spend, spend time doing things that I enjoy doing. Um, if you, if you spend all your time at work and, and, uh, you go home and you don't do the things that you enjoy, you're going to get burned out really quickly, especially in a profession like this. So it's important to, um, balance the stress that you get that you have at work with happiness and and with hobbies uh, outside of work but in terms of time it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to spend 50 percent of your time at work and 50 percent of your time in your personal life so that that, that i think is is important for for anybody that's you know going to an, into any career is just under understand that the work-life balance is so different from each person uh, and it's really all about how you feel if you're happy with with uh, the amount of time you're at work and with the amount of time that you're at home then then that's your work-life balance and you need to stick to trying to achieve that level of balance so it's more about quality time then, right exactly it's more about quality than quantity 100 percent. okay that's that's i kind of had an idea i didn't know that it was that intense though for somebody in, in a position like yours <laughs> What would you recommend uh, students in high school or college to prepare for them to do to prepare for a career like yours? Well, so it's, it's you know, starting off kind of with the basics. I mean, you have to do really well in school. Um, you have to make sure that you are somebody that um, is is teachable, um, somebody that, that listens and, and doesn't just think that you are, um, you know, the best at everything. Um, there's always somebody that's, that's, that's better than you are, smarter than you are. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, I mean, I, I, by no means would I say that I'm the smartest person in the world. Um, but I, I felt like I was pretty, you know, pretty solid student, um, all the way up through undergrad. Uh, and it wasn't until I got into medical school that I really realized that there's some just brilliant people in the world. And, and there's people that, I mean, they can talk to you about anything from culture to uh, politics, to medicine, to, you know, it, it was, it was unbelievable the level of, of knowledge and, and, um, uh, culture that, that you experience, um, especially if, if you, if you travel and you, you know, you leave your local comfort zone. Um, so it's important to be teachable, to understand, to be humble, I guess, to, to understand, to be confident, but humble, humble in the sense that you're confident that you can do well. Um, and that you kind of pat yourself on the back kind of behind closed doors and, and, and you know that you succeeded, but also humble in the sense that, um, you can always work harder. You can always strive for more, um, but I think th- those are the really sort of the backbone behind um, getting to uh, medical school and then and then and then succeeding in medicine. Because once you get to medical school, you know, good job, you made it to medical school. But then it's the whole other beast of, you know, not not being able to sleep very much because you're studying and the stresses and and so um, I think you you also it's also important to have a good um, uh, support system, uh, whether it be friends, whether it be family. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're somewhere distant away from your friends and family, then, then having some sort of support, uh, you know, be it through, you know, either, either church or through athletics or something to where you can fall back on and just kind of vent, um, that's really important as well. Um, so, so I think those are the, the main things, um, you know, you, you can, you can always study, uh, but it's hard to teach, um, humility and, and, um, and, um, uh, that's that's kind of the main thing. It's really it's really hard to teach somebody to be to be humble. You have to you have to just you know learn to just accept the fact that you're not always going to be the smartest one, but you have to work the hardest. And sometimes I can imagine that it could be hard unless you get slapped in the face with reality. That's when you realize, okay, this is not how I thought it was going to go. Yeah, I mean, I I have a good three or four moments that that uh, are personally shared. Nobody was around. When, when those moments happened. And I mean, they, they shaped my whole, you know, decade of medicine because uh, they were <laughs> kind of like you said, I mean, that's a perfect description is big slaps in the face of like, holy crap, this isn't what uh, uh, I thought, you know, I, did, I thought I was going to pass. So I didn't pass or I thought I was going to do better or I thought I was going to be this and I wasn't. And, and so there's, there's a lot of moments like that. And, you know, it's a matter of persevering through it. And, and again, having that, having that support system or, or at least being able to pick yourself up and, and, um, and pushing through. 
So what factors besides education and experience may impact somebody's ability to work in your field? Like, for example, uh, them having good credit, credit, a clean background, availability to um, travel, working outside of the eight to five hours or anything like that. Yeah, so um, I think uh, that's a tough question. So, you know, in terms of um, being able to to work as a physician, um, I guess, you know, you, you need to understand that the hours may sometimes be erratic. Um, you do need to, um, I guess there, there are certain medical, um, I don't want to say requirements, but, but people can have certain medical conditions, I guess, that, that would um, prevent them from, you know, going into medicine. But it, it's, there's not very many, uh, you know, things like, like, uh, like schizophrenia, those sorts of things, if they're un, 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 uh, untreated, I think would be, would be difficult to, uh, to be able to go into medicine. But um, obviously, you know, you can't be somebody who's, who's uh, abusing drugs, um, alcohol included i mean it, it, you just wouldn't for one you wouldn't be able to function but you'd also just be a danger to, to your patients um but you know aside from that um there's not a whole whole lot of other limitations um i guess you know trying to think it, that there are a lot of foreign graduates um that that are from you know mexico Mexico or from from anywhere in the world, uh, Middle East, from from uh, from China, from from all over the world that that um, are physicians. Um, but the way the uh, you know the way medicine and the system works here in the U.S. is you do have to pass the the exams um, to be able to practice in the United States. And I guess so. I guess that would be one other. Um, I don't know if it's a limitation, but a requirement in order to be able to practice here. Um, but there's there's plenty of them, and then they do really really well. It's just a matter of getting through that extra hurdle. And I would assume also a clean, a clean background or somebody with a criminal background would be able to work in that field. Uh, you know, I I I don't know if if you have a criminal background, if you would be allowed to practice. I, I'm sure it would be definitely very difficult to get a job because there's plenty of physicians that don't have a criminal background. Um, and obviously, if you if you get a criminal background while you're working, uh, that would be a major issue. Um, you know, medicine is very highly regulated by by a lot of different um, boards. Uh, you have to you know constantly be re renewing your licenses, and so you know here in Texas we have the Texas Medical Board, um, and so all those things require you to be a, a pretty decent human being. And you know obviously you can't be doing things that uh, any any kind of criminal activity because that could affect your license. You can get your license suspended. You can get it. Um, completely taken away depending on what you do. Okay, so thinking back on your first job, uh, did did it play a role in developing any of the skills that you have right now that you use for your current position? Oh man, yeah. So so I was always I always loved going to work. Uh, you know, starting when I was sixteen. Um, actually, my, my first job was at Spencer's at the mall. Okay. Um, but I also, you know, I worked at at uh, clothing stores. I worked at at um, American Eagle. I worked at restaurants. I worked at Pizza Hut and Bennigan's. Um, I even worked at Disney World for a little bit. Um, so so I think it's it's really important if you're able to go and get a job. It's it's okay. it's just not. It's not. I mean, money is like the least uh most important thing of what you're going to get out of working um you get to you get to interact with people um uh, your coworkers. you get to interact with people from all over uh from different lifestyles uh and then you get you get to practice you know what it is to to uh take care of um customers and i mean uh by no means do i consider my patients customers but it's somebody that you're trying to provide a service for um and so so it's you know learning those skills learning the skill sets learning how to talk to people how not to talk to people um learning to you know to bite your tongue sometimes uh, learning to um again be humble um but also learning when you need to stand up for yourself and learning you know when when it it's uh, you know no is no, and uh, so there's just there's a lot of different things that you can learn from from work, uh, and so I would definitely recommend if it, you know as soon as you turn 16, you know get a job and 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 just get into the workforce because it's it's so important, it's so helpful just for life skills, uh, and and you know again money is like the least of the you know, obviously you know it's nice to have money, but but the things that you learn regardless of where where you work I think is is hugely important. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Herrera, again, for taking the time for this interview. The information you shared is extremely valuable and will impact the lives of those viewing this video. If you're interested you in so learning much. more, I'm sorry? No, thank you so much for, for uh, having me here. And it's a lot of information and a lot of students will actually benefit from that, which is great. And they're going to learn about a different 
occupation in the medical field that they may have not known about. So if yeah, you're well, interested, and, and, and yeah. what I would say is definitely, I would definitely say anybody here that, that's interested in medicine, I, I definitely would say go for it. Um, you know, I, I, I love what I do, and I, and I, I don't know anybody that doesn't. Uh, anybody that goes into medicine, I think they feel extremely fortunate to be able to do what they do. Um, so so, uh, so give it a go if, you, if you're interested in medicine. I definitely would support it. And guys, if you're interested in learning about this career or any other careers, we encourage you to explore Texas Reality Check, which will allow you to determine if the career will, career will meet your future salary needs. You can also explore Texas Career Check, Own It, and Career Coach to dig deeper into your research. Links may be found on our websites, which you can see right here. And thank you for watching. Bye. So again, thank you so much for joining us today for our third day of the Career Conference. Uh, we hope you enjoy the interviews. Uh, we welcome you back tomorrow. Tomorrow we will be starting at 8.30. And we'll go all the way through with four employer interviews again tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be focusing on finance and business. We have four great employers lined up to go ahead and present to you tomorrow. We will also be having a closing remarks by Mr. Martinez White. Again, a lot of high energy to close out the session. And we appreciate everyone that logged in today. And again, a reminder, all of these interviews that have been pre-recorded are available to you as educators for your classes. Just reach out to us at david at wfsolutions.org or at getempoweredwfsolutions.org. Uh, for the rest of the day, hope you have a great one, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.